If you only learn one thing in this course, you should learn that nucleophiles react with electrophiles. When it comes to understanding organic reactivity and especially drawing reaction mechanisms, this is the foundational principle of organic chemistry. But if these terms are unfamiliar to you, and they may well be, it's important to recognize that you've probably seen this idea before. It's the fundamental idea of Lewis acid base theory. What's previously been called a Lewis base in, for example, your introductory chemistry course, is the same thing as a nucleophile. Nucleophile is simply a different name for it that emphasizes the fact that Lewis bases are attracted to positive regions like nuclei. Similarly, you understand what an electrophile is, even if you've never heard the term before, from Lewis acid base theory. And naturally here, an electrophile is just a Lewis acid. The term electrophile emphasizes the idea that Lewis acids, because they want to accept electrons, are attracted to electron-rich regions. In this video, we're going to see this principle in action by taking a look at some electrostatic potential maps and discuss features of good nucleophiles and good electrophiles that you'll want to look out for when predicting reactivity and drawing mechanisms. As we just mentioned, the Lewis acid base theory is based on the idea that chemical reactions occur because groups or atoms that are electron rich, that have an excess of electrons, which we call Lewis bases, donate electrons to groups that are electron poor or electron deficient that we call Lewis acids. In organic chemistry, the terms nucleophile and electrophile are used more commonly, but a nucleophile just is a Lewis base. Lewis bases donate electrons from their electron-rich regions, and so being able to identify electron-rich regions within molecules is a fundamental skill in predicting organic reactivity. Take the molecule shown here, for example, ethanol. Here's an electrostatic potential map for ethanol that shows us the electron density of the molecule. What this map tells us is that the alkyl region of the molecule, the CH2-CH3 fragment, is relatively electron neutral, and this is normal for alkyl regions. But within the hydroxyl group, we get a remarkable polarization of the electron density, with high electron density near the oxygen atom here, and low electron density near the hydrogen here. In thinking about ethanol as a nucleophile, then, we should zero in on the oxygen atom as a region of high electron density. Considering that the oxygen has two non-bonding lone pairs, this just reinforces the idea on the Lewis structure that the oxygen is electron-rich, or partially negative. Lewis acids, on the other hand, accept electrons because they're electron deficient. In organic chemistry, we more often call Lewis acids electrophiles, since they're attracted to electron-rich regions. They're electron-loving in that sense. The molecule shown here is protonated acetic acid. It's acetic acid with one additional proton. And for that reason, it's positively charged. Here's an electrostatic potential map for protonated acetic acid. There's some interesting things to notice about this. One point we're going to return to later is that formal charges can be misleading. Notice that even though the oxygen is formally positively charged, and in fact this other oxygen is formally positively charged in an alternative resonance form of this molecule, in the electrostatic potential map, the oxygens are clearly electron-rich, at least relative to everything else within the molecule. The formal charge is misleading in that sense, since this would lead you to believe that those oxygens are electron-deficient. In fact, though, the electron-deficient region of this molecule is the area near the hydrogen atoms, as evidenced by the deep blue here. It's a little bit more difficult to see, but another important electron deficient region is associated with the central carbonyl carbon, which is surrounded by a light blue area. Identifying these regions using the electrostatic potential maps allows us to make pretty good guesses about the reactivity of these molecules with each other. For example, we can conclude that this molecule is likely to be an electrophile because of its relatively large region of low electron density and its formal positive charge, and that the hydrogens are likely to be the most electrophilic sites in this molecule, with the carbonyl carbon playing an important role as well. So from these determinations alone, we can immediately begin to guess, for example, that if these two molecules were to react with each other, the major reaction pathway would involve a proton transfer from protonated acetic acid to ethanol from the most electron-rich region of ethanol to the most electron-poor region of protonated acetic acid. But another reactivity type that might be important is addition of the oxygen atom to the carbonyl carbon, which is also electron-deficient. And although we'll very rarely actually use electrostatic potential maps, 
to make these conclusions. Our goal in the long run is to be able to see the underlying electron density distribution from the Lewis structures alone. And we'll talk about heuristics that help us do this in the remainder of this video. And of course, it often won't be explicitly stated that you need to identify the nucleophile and electrophile in such and such a new reaction. But even if it's not stated, you should do this for every new reaction that you encounter. Identify the nucleophile and electrophile, not just on the level of which molecule is the nucleophile and electrophile, but which groups within each molecule, which functional groups or even which atoms are serving as the nucleophile and electrophile. This will help you make mechanistic connections between different reactions, make them easier to remember, and make the prediction of products from an arbitrary organic reaction much easier. Based on our discussion so far, it should be clear that nucleophilic atoms or groups possess significant negative charge or high energy electrons. And these are really two ways of kind of saying the same thing. And of course, acting as a nucleophile is analogous to acting as a Bronsted base, since if we take away the Lewis acid, then we can see the base as just donating a pair of electrons in either case, right? Whether that's to H in a Bronsted acid or some other atom like, say, carbon in a Lewis acid. And so we can think of Bronsted basicity just as a special case of Lewis basicity, meaning anything you've learned previously about what makes a strong Bronsted base is going to apply in the Lewis base case as well. Here are some structural factors to consider when identifying nucleophilic atoms or groups. The first is trends in localized or NBO energies. This key idea that in general, non-bonding electrons are higher in energy than pi bonding electrons, which are higher in energy than sigma bonding electrons. This often allows us to rule out sigma and pi bonds in molecules that contain high energy non-bonding lone pairs, and ethanol is a classic example. There's no reason really to consider any of the sigma bonds in this molecule as electron donors. While we certainly could draw curved arrows that show sigma bonds acting as electron donors, that kind of reactivity is unlikely because we have higher energy electrons within the molecule. Electronegativity also plays a huge role. Say, for example, we had narrowed down the nucleophilic atoms in this molecule to oxygen and nitrogen, noticing the lone pairs on both of these, and we now need to decide which is more nucleophilic oxygen or nitrogen. Well, considering that nitrogen is less electronegative than oxygen, this suggests that it's more likely to donate its lone pair than oxygen is. Oxygen holds onto that lone pair more tightly. So the more likely nucleophile here is nitrogen because it's less electronegative than oxygen. In recognizing nucleophiles, it's also really important to think about resonance structures because alternative resonance forms can often reveal hidden nucleophilic, or for that matter, electrophilic sites. In this molecule, for example, we might notice that this oxygen has lone pairs and a negative charge, suggesting that that oxygen is strongly nucleophilic, and it is. But the molecule has an alternative resonance form in which nitrogen, which by the way also bears a lone pair, even in this resonance form, has a negative charge. Returning to ideas of electronegativity and noticing that we have O- minus and N- minus in these two different resonance forms, suggests that the nitrogen is going to be the most nucleophilic atom in this molecule because it's less electronegative, once again, than oxygen. More generally, though, we just want to keep in mind that either nitrogen or oxygen can serve as a nucleophilic group in this molecule, and to some extent, which atom reacts depends on the nature and identity of the electrophile that this molecule is reacting with. Hybridization is another factor that's important to consider. And by now you've probably noticed that many of these factors track with the stability factors we've talked about already, electronegativity, resonance, and now hybridization. And the idea with hybridization is that hybridization affects the energy and thus the stability of non-bonding electrons in hybrid orbitals. So for example, looking at this molecule, we can whittle down its nucleophilic possibilities to either the non-bonding lone pair on the carbonyl oxygen, which is sp2 hybridized, or the hydroxyl oxygen, which is sp3, hybridized. While once again it is important to keep both of these in mind as possibilities, the more nucleophilic of the two is likely to be the sp3 hybridized oxygen, because the sp3 hybridized lone pair is higher in energy than the sp2 hybridized lone pair. And the final factor worth considering is inductive effects, and here once again we have a situation where we have two groups that are likely to be quite nucleophilic, the two negatively charged oxygen atoms here. 
In fact, they look very similar. They're both resonance stabilized, they both have lone pairs, they both have negative charge, so on and so forth. The key difference between them is that one of them is closer to the inductively electron withdrawing or the electronegative NH2 group than the other. This carboxylate group is closer to NH2 than this one is. Because of the withdrawing effect of the NH2 group, we should expect that this carboxylate on the left is just a little more nucleophilic than the carboxylate on the right. And here once again we have one of the key stability factors, inductive effects. So just to summarize here, these are the things you really want to think about in evaluating the nucleophilicity of atoms within a molecule. And the factors here are really a generalization of the factors governing acidity and basicity that we talked about in the last series of videos. Keep in mind that the only difference between acting as a Lewis base and a Bronsted base is the identity of the electrophilic atom that the base is reacting with. All of these nucleophiles are just donating electrons to something. And so thinking about them as Bronsted bases is a useful line of thought if our goal is to determine how they might behave as Lewis bases. They possess significant positive charge and or low energy empty orbitals. And these are really two ways of saying the same thing once again. And of course, acting as an electrophile here is analogous to acting as a Bronsted acid in that an atom is accepting electrons. And so a Lewis acid in general is going to do something like this. But this is analogous to acting as a Bronsted acid since an atom within a Bronsted acid accepts a pair of electrons in an exactly analogous way. In the Lewis case, the electrons are coming from a different source, not necessarily the HA bond. But the idea of accepting electrons onto A is still the same. And so, as we just mentioned, we can use some of those ideas about structural comparisons of acidity in identifying electrophilic groups as well. And that's going to be really important to apply, once again, as I've said before, in predicting reactivity and drawing mechanisms. So structural factors to consider here, trends in NBO energies once again. But now, because we're interested in the electron accepting properties of the molecule, we're going to think about the empty NBOs and recognize, for example, that the most reactive empty NBO is generally the empty atomic orbital, followed by the pi star orbital, followed by the sigma star orbital. So for example, in the molecule shown here, the most electrophilic atom is likely to be the boron. This is part of a six electron building block, and so it's electron deficient. It doesn't even have an octet of electrons. This will be even more reactive than the pi star orbital associated with the carbon-carbon double bond here. And of course, more reactive than all of the sigma antibonds, which are much higher in energy. The electronegativity of electron accepting atoms is important to consider as well. For example, we might identify the pi antibonds of the carbon-nitrogen and carbon-oxygen double bonds here as the most important electron accepting groups within this molecule and start thinking about electron flow like donating a pair here or donating a pair here. Which of these is likely to be the more favorable pathway? Well, if we consider electronegativity and recognize that oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen, then we can conclude that the oxygen is likely to be the most electrophilic atom within this molecule suggesting that this type of electron flow adding to the carbon of the CO double bond is going to be more favorable than adding to the carbon of the CN double bond. Resonance structures here are also important to consider. As we saw in the first example of this video, Lewis structures can be misleading in terms of the atoms they will lead you to believe are electron deficient. In this molecule, the nitrogen is not electron deficient, and you could verify this if you calculated an electrostatic potential map for this molecule. In fact, the second best resonance structure, which places positive charge on the carbon atom, does a much better job of showing us the actual electron density distribution in this molecule. In this second best resonance form, the nitrogen is neutral and the carbon is positively charged. And in fact, this carbon is the most electrophilic atom in this molecule, not the nitrogen. This gets to the point that resonance structures can show us hidden sites of reactivity, hidden in the sense that if we didn't draw the resonance form, or at least think about the resonance form, we, we would not identify that position as a potential electrophile or nucleophile for that matter. Finally, inductive effects are once again important to consider here. So the molecule here contains a large number of sigma bonds, but only two of the sigma bonds are associated with relatively electronegative or electron accepting atoms, the two bromines. It looks like 
Either of these sigma star antibonds should be able to serve as electrophiles through electron flow like this. But if we were tasked with identifying the most electrophilic of these two, we would want to consider the influence of this fluorine substituent on their relative reactivity. Fluorine is a strongly electron withdrawing or electronegative substituent, and so that's going to pull electron density away from the carbon chain and away from this carbon that's closer to the fluorine, much more so than it's going to pull electron density from this carbon that's farther away. And so, once again, if we were tasked with choosing the most electrophilic group within this molecule, this carbon bromine bond would be expected to be more reactive than the carbon-bromine bond on the right. That all comes down to inductive effects. So to summarize here once again, the big idea of electrophiles is that they possess significant positive charge or low energy, low-lying empty orbitals like empty atomic orbitals or pi star orbitals or sigma star orbitals associated with electronegative atoms or groups like halogens, for example. The stability factors that modulate the energies of molecules or groups are important to consider in judging relative electrophilicity. So we're looking for highly electronegative atoms that want to accept electrons, resonance structures that illustrate to us regions of considerable positive charge, recognizing that Lewis structures can be deceiving and don't always map well onto the true electron density distribution of a molecule, and inductive effects, realizing that the electron pushing and pulling effects of donating and withdrawing groups inductively can influence the reactivity of electron accepting groups like carbon-halogen bonds or polarized carbon-heteroatom pi bonds.